there's a, a lot of uh, people nowadays, they know all about shamanism. And uh, if you ask any 10 people in the room here what is shamanism, you get probably about six and a half different answers. And some of them overlapping and some of them entirely independent of each other. And so I guess it's necessary to talk for just a moment or two about uh, how we are practicing shamanism. Uh, a lot of people, when they hear the word shamanism nowadays, the next thing they think is ayahuasca, right? And this is one kind of shamanism. But there is a, a basic connection between all the people who are practicing shamanism. And that is that they are working together with the spirits of the earth. This is the bottom line. No spirits, no shaman. So how do we come to meet these spirits? Most of us have had experiences, experiences which we cannot explain, or maybe we can explain. But these are experiences of the aliveness, the vibrancy of the earth. So that you, when you look at a tree, it's more than a tree. It's a vibrant being. Right? And what the shaman does is the shaman makes a shift in consciousness. The shaman makes a shift in consciousness. And this is done in any number of ways. Psychotropic drugs, plants, stillness and silence, a lot of noise with drums and rattles, chanting, singing, dancing. All of these, all of these are methods that the shaman uses. These are the tools. But the power of the shaman is not in the way he goes through the door into the world of the spirits. It's what happens after that. And the work of the shaman is to go to the world of the spirits to ask for help. The shaman works by asking for help. And the shaman brings that help back with her to the physical world. A lot of people have a hard time understanding this. They have this vision of the shaman as being some sort of uh, psychic super person, right? A man or woman, child, whatever. But it, it's, it's not that. It's simply a connection. The connection to the world of the spirits and the relationship the shaman has with his spirit helpers. I know it can sound like mumbo jumbo, but I have a feeling that people who come to the talks at uh, Schumacher, they're a little bit more open to things like this. So maybe it sounds perfectly normal uh, to some of you, maybe even most of you. But the beautiful thing about shamanism is that it opens the door to a new kind of responsibility. The shaman in the traditional societies was a person who carried a lot of responsibility. In traditional societies, in many traditional societies, where there was shamanism, where there is shamanism, people didn't want to do it. Too much responsibility. Too much responsibility. And also in some societies, the people around the shaman thought, if he has the power to heal, he also has the power to harm. Right. Interesting. So the shaman is working with uh, something we call power. And, and this is a very uncomfortable word in English. 
Uh, I'm sorry, all the people who've been on the course for the last uh, almost two weeks. This is sort of a rehash for you, but uh, we'll be over it soon. Yeah. <laughs> Power. Power. Okay. So today, people flock to shaman courses. They buy tickets to go to the Amazon so they can take ayahuasca for three weeks, right? so that they can have these experiences. When you get beyond the point where uh, peak experiences are no longer so meaningful, then you're really ready to step into the work. Because it's a work that will change you. Now, we're here at uh, Schumacher, and many of the people also here at Dartington. We're very much involved with what's happening today, with the environment. The shaman has been right there for the last hmm, 250,000 years. Taking care of the environment. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to this um, altar space here. And um, uh, I use things like this to help me remember, because really I think I do know it all the time, I just forget. Just like um, we often forget that we are uh, children of the earth and we are at home here and we are not alone. But we forget it all the time. So uh, we use tools like this to help us remember. There is a feather for air and there is fire. And sometimes uh, these four elements, when we think of them, maybe it sounds a little, you know, spiritual. But actually, they help me remember about the body of the earth and about my body. They help me to remember that I need air to live. I need to breathe. I need water to drink. I need food that comes from the earth. And I need fire in my heart from the sun and to have heating and cook. All these things, all these things keep us alive. So uh, there is a real physical reality here. And for me, one of the main things about working in this way is that we see that uh, body and soul, matter and spirit are not separate, but they are connected together and they help each other. And there is no need to separate them. You know, uh, body supports soul, soul supports body. And this is what this reminds me of, that I am here um, to work with both the body and the spirit of the earth. And one of the final things I wanted to say about this is it's very easy to go into what we sometimes call empty ritual, where you just do things for the sake of it. And for me, the heart of the work is that we bring our heart to it, is that we bring um, a real wish to be connected to the body of the earth and also to all the other things that we can't see. Because as humans, we have come to really uh, favor our visual sense for some reason uh, and forgetting about the other senses and forgetting very much about the unseen world that is all around us. And in a way, one of the things, uh, we've had a wonderful time here at Schumacher and Dartington. And, um, and I really feel that uh, science and shamanism go very well hand in hand. And uh, if I were to say that we talk a lot about on our course about spiritual ecology and the need to bring a spiritual aspect to 
the sense of what's going on in the world today. That we cannot heal this situation with the world only through a physical sense, only through physical action. But we also need to bring the soul back to the earth and to ourselves and to our homes. And, um, and to do that, we need to step into whatever work we're doing with real heart and commitment. It's not about doing fancy rituals with fancy tools. It's about really bringing yourself and your heart wish into this power that can help us. Uh, this reminds me, uh, before, before we came here, uh, I, I went to uh, what we call a, a journey, right? A journey into the spirit world uh, to ask for help and advice from my spirits for the work that we're, we've been doing here. Uh, the shaman knows that uh, uh, he cannot work alone. And, and this is a, a pitfall that uh, a lot of us in our everyday lives, we get to thinking, I've got to do this. Right. Well, you do, but you're not doing it alone. Nothing. You do not do anything alone. You are so interdependent. We all are. Right. We all know that. But uh, I went to ask for help and advice, and, and what Zara just said reminded me of the, one of the things I was told, and that was to remember to keep my heart open. And, and this is, this is a, a really a pre, a prerequisite about keeping your heart open. And when I first started to do this work, uh, that was very difficult for me because a lot of us have experiences in life which we think teach us that if we're going to survive, or if we're going to uh -huh, succeed, then, uh, in fact, we have to protect our hearts. We have to protect our hearts. And a lot of people, when they come on uh, groups with us, uh, they ask us, uh, what about uh, protection? I need a safe place to work. I, I love it when they say that. I need a safe place to work. And most of the time we think we're safe. Uh, uh, this is, this is uh, one of the great uh, fantasies that we tell ourselves, right? We're safe. But all of us, everyone in this room, I'm sure, has had an experience where in less than a moment, I, I use this... Uh, non-measurable period of time, right? In less than a moment, our lives have changed. Right? For example, we give birth, or somebody dies, or the stock market drops, right? And this can happen any time. And yet we, we walk around, and one of the major things that we work for in our lives is safety and security. I, I don't want to go on a course unless I can be safe. Right? You want to walk out the door, right? Going to be safe? Yeah? Forget it. But the way the shaman works is not to protect herself, not to walk with a shield around herself, but to fill herself with power so that when the accident happens, when the stock market crashes, when somebody dies, when the house burns down, of course it's a shock, but the shaman is filled with power 
the shaman is not paralyzed. This is why the shaman works with power. But it's not his power. No spirits, no shaman. The shaman, over the years, builds a relationship with various different spirit helpers. Uh, this week, uh, with our wonderful group, uh, we've been working with the power of place. Be here now. Right? You can't be any place else. Right? So, what is the power of the place? Right? You walk into a room like this, and uh, there are a whole lot of empty seats, and you sit in one, and ah, it doesn't quite feel right here. Yeah? You get up, you move to another place. Oh, that's a little better. After a couple of minutes, well, there's that empty place over there. I think I'll move over. Ah, oh, yeah, this is much better. Right? It's because you're in alignment with the power of that place. There's not one place in here which has the same energy. Right? And it's defined where your energy is matching. And we do these kind of things all the time. All the time. And uh, sometimes it takes a very long time, even for me. I've been practicing, I've been teaching for 30 years almost, and practicing for about 40. And sometimes, you know, I just realized the other day, I don't like to go into that supermarket, right? There's just something about the vibe there. Right? I, don't, I don't like that one. But I like this one over here. And it's not because it's cheaper or more expensive or better quality or worse quality. No, no. It's something about the energy of the place. And of course, I like the vegetable section where all these wonderful organic vegetables are, right? Yes, that's my favorite place in the supermarket once I get past the chocolate. Right? <laughs> so, you know, we, we're doing this all the time. Even people who have no training in this whatsoever, right? No, I don't like to walk down that side of the street. I want to walk down this side of the street. I do it every day. I've been doing it every day for 47 years, right? It's because of the energy. So a little, a little uh, game you can play with yourself sometime is to start to be aware of this. Start to be aware of this. I know that Uncle Sigmund, he, he said this is something about being obsessive or something like that, right? Forget Uncle Sigmund, right? Cousin Carl. Right? He, he, was, he was maybe a shaman, in fact. But, uh, you know, don't worry about what you read in the book. Oh. <laughs> was that my heart beating? <laughs> It's what's in your heart. It's what's, what you're feeling. What you're feeling. Yeah. And for me, one of the most wonderful things about working like this is it opens my heart wider and wider. And for me, that's a very wonderful way to live. And I want to live like that. And the more I live like that, the more I want to live like that. And working with the spirits means that when I come into a room, I have to remind myself that there is more to this world than what we see. There is more than the things I can touch. And this used to be a really uh, clear sense. And, and we have forgotten a lot of this because um, we're in a rush. I think, a lot of the time. And one of the things that working in this way with the spirits and the spirits of nature have told me is I feel like this very ecological way of being, which is about interdependence, which is about realizing that I need to ask for help. And for instance, the water can help me. The air can help me. These beautiful plants can help me. And so I remember that I'm not alone. And I remember that I don't have to do everything myself. 
And when I begin to open myself up like that, I feel that also the world opens itself up to me. And in my experience, when we stop and listen, uh, there is a lot to be heard in the world. But it can be hard to stop and listen because then you have to stop and listen even more and even more. And sometimes when we go and talk to a tree or a plant, we have so much to tell it. We have so much we want to ask it. And maybe we have all these things that we want. We want help. We want medicine. We want wisdom. We want just a sign that I'm not totally crazy talking to this tree. But what will it take for us to just stop and listen? And for me, when we do that, the world really begins to open up. And then I feel there is a lot of help and power available to me in ways I cannot see. And it means that I can keep walking and do so much more than I ever, ever, ever thought was possible. And for me, this has been very true in my life. I have done things that 20 years ago I just you know, I just knew I would just run away and hide in my bed. So, um, for me, it's a wonderful thing to know that the world is really alive and we are really alive. And I don't want to be just a physical machine walking around. I want to feel every part of my being, the visible and the invisible. And I want to respond to other amazing, miraculous, living beings, people and trees and animals and air molecules and even little things like trolls in the woods of Scandinavia where I come from. And the trolls, they're all the unseen people that um, we used to tell stories about and that we used to kind of believe in, at least in a sort of half way. Uh, they have become more and more invisible because we don't talk to them anymore. We don't tell their stories. We don't think that they are there. And so this invisible world becomes more and more invisible. And sometimes I think the spirits are like an endangered species because we have totally forgotten how to listen. Reminds me that uh, uh, I just heard yesterday from uh, Stefan uh, that uh, there was a, a shaman from South America up here. And uh, he went and talked to the amazing yew tree you have up by the church here. And he said that this... Uh, Yew tree was uh, a little bit uh, sad about things because people didn't come and talk to it. Right. But uh, when we went up there yesterday, uh, it, it seemed a lot more cheerful. But uh, apparently, Stefan said a lot more people have been coming and talking to it <laughs> since the shaman said that. You know, uh, so. It's, and it's a, it's a wonderful practice, and what a beautiful, what a beautiful being that is, you know? And so if, if you're sitting there thinking, uh, these guys are, are pretty crazy, it sounds nice what they're saying, but I just can't get it, you know? It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> Go talk to the yew tree. Go talk to the yew tree. Just spend five minutes standing there with your hands on this beautiful being, so ancient, so much wisdom is there. And go ahead, you know, you got something on your heart, say it, say it, say it to the yew tree. And listen, listen with your entire being. We have these uh, wonderful ears, right? And they bring us all kinds of wonderful music and wonderful, beautiful voices and bird song and the, the wind and the trees yesterday. What a symphony we heard out there. 
Yeah, it's beautiful. But if you listen to the yew tree, you'll feel it with your entire being. And you'll know, you'll hear the answer. You'll hear the answer. These practices are very simple. You, you don't have to, you don't have to have been on 17 shaman courses to learn how to do this. You only have to, as Zara said, stop. Be where you are. Listen with your entire being. The world is vibrant around us. Everything is alive. Yeah, even, even this uh, very modern table and this uh, microphone, whatever it's called, stand. Yeah, right? And my, where, where, where'd it go? There you are, okay. Yeah, so it has a spirit, right? And when you allow yourself to open up to this, you'll find that your life comes much richer. I remember when I lived in New York City, I thought, oh, wow, New York City, da, 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 right? Columbia University, oh, wee, wow, you know? Right, I was miserable. <laughs> Fifteen years later, I had an income of about uh, 4,000 pounds a year. I was alive, right? And that was when I started talking to the trees and when they started talking to me because I was listening. We're, we're in this world to live. We're not in this world to put ourselves on a track. We're in this world to shine our light. We're in this world to be together with our hearts open. Feeling the love. It's all around. I know, okay, he's an old hippie. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so we also went up to the U today on our way here because it just didn't feel right to come in here and talk about all these things, the voice of the earth, without really going to talk to one of the oldest people around here, which is that really ancient U tree that's been here before many other things, not the rocks, but most other living things. And... Um, and I asked the yew tree, did it want to contribute anything to this evening? And it said, um, tell them that they're all humans. <laughs> and I felt this was a wonderful invitation from the tree. It was saying that we are related. And the wonderful thing for me, I mean, I just love science. And for me, when I hear stories like Stefan was telling us yesterday, I feel science brings me closer to the miracle of life. And all those things that we know are there but still can't understand or explain, like photosynthesis. And we know it's happening, but we don't know what is happening. But yet we can't survive without it. That life spark that bringing down of the energy of the sun and converting it into something that we can receive. And um, so I've just felt that this was a wonderful invitation to consider. And one of the things that Stefan also told us yesterday was if you go back really far enough, and I know most of you have heard this, but it's good to remember these things and really uh, remember them, you know, with your heart and your feet and your blood, is he said, if you go back long enough, we are physically 
all related. We all came from these same little creatures. And so the yew tree really reminded me of this invitation to uh, open up to the fact that maybe we are not all so different and that we can talk to one another, maybe not in human language, but maybe by touch or song or just listening and to open to this possibility. And uh, the, the thing about touching uh, is, is so wonderful, you know, and it's something we've gotten to be so afraid of in our culture, right? You're sitting there uh, on, on a bus and it's one of these bench kind of affairs, right? And you're sitting there and somebody sits next to you, right? What do you do? You just, just a few millimeters, right? It's automatic, right? And then all of a sudden, a whole lot of people get on at the next bus stop and you're like this, you know, oh my God, what's happening to me? Wow, you're being loved, man. <laughs> whether, you, whether you can feel it or not, this is what's happening. We're all coming together, right? And this is the way, this is the way it should be. Privacy, I, I love this word, uh, that means privacy, right? Okay. <laughs> privacy is, is this uh, concept that we put a lot of value on nowadays. But uh, in most places in the world, it just doesn't exist. You know exactly what's going on in the house next door. And if you're you know, going to the jungle in South America, You've got 70 people living in the same house, right? You hear everything, right? But you, you learn, you know, to, oh, okay, that's all right, yeah. But, but we're all in this together, and that's, that's what we forget. We're all in this together. This is why this wonderful Miguel was here last week, and he talked about the bubble of hope, the bubble of hope. Because, you know, our culture is uh, on a, a full speed ahead collision course, right? And we all know that. And uh, so he said, but you know, there's places like Schumacher College and uh, the Garden in Berkeley, and he named other places. And all these places are bubbles of hope. We are all bubbles of hope. Right. And the closer we get to each other, whoop, the bubble gets bigger, right? So when you're all jammed there together on the subway, remember the bubble of hope, right? <laughs> Think positively. It might actually infect the people next to you, and they might think positively too. Of course, they're all going to be busy da, 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 like that. But uh, what I'm waiting for is for somebody to invent an app that jams all <laughs> the iPhones in the railroad car, right? That's, ah, oh, I love it. Uh, I do have that old, you know, 1968 anarchist in me, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, we could ask the spirit. No, 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 no. No, no, that's Which, not the way you use the spirits, <laughs> right? Which brings me to say something about that. Very well demonstrated by Jonathan, yes. Um, that when we work with the spirit, and in the beginning Jonathan was talking a little bit about power, and for me there are kind of two ways of working with power. And one is what we call in Scandinavian kraft, and the other is makt. And they're not different kinds of power, really. They're just about how we use them. And we do not work asking the spirits for everything that we want, for a bigger house or easy passage through the traffic jam or mm, more jam on my toast. <laughs> um, we try and ask the spirits what we need, what we really need. And for me, in a way, this also shifts 
completely the way I feel about being in the world, where I know that I don't need so many things that I want, but the things that I really need will probably be given to me. And when I do get the things I need, I say thank you. And in my thank you, I give back to the world, maybe not physically, but uh, to the spirit and the soul of the earth. And uh, nowadays, without thinking about it, we take a lot, we take resources all the time. And when do we remember to stop and say thank you for this beautiful glass of water or for the food or for the car that gets me to work? Uh, just so many moments every day that we can say thank you for what we do have and for what we are given. And when we say thank you, it's like we give a gift of love to the earth and it hears us and it responds and it gets fed. And then the spirit of the earth gets stronger and more alive. Someone is listening and someone is talking. And uh, the, what you were saying uh, reminds me yesterday at uh, the end of our walk with uh, Stefan. Our walk, which covered 4.6 billion years in 4.6 kilometers. We got to the last uh, 30 centimeters, right? And, uh, and he starts pointing out that th this is when mammals appeared, and this is when the first humanoid creatures appeared. And, you know, finally we got down to the last two millimeters, right? This is, this is the Industrial Revolution. It's going very fast. Uh, I, I read uh, Dr. Schumacher's book when it came out in the early 70s. And uh, appropriate technology, God, it sounded so wonderful, you know. And I thought about, uh, you know, all these things. It just was really opening my mind. And even though I was about to have a nervous breakdown, uh, I was thrilled to read such enlightened statements in this book. And then I came to one of the most horrifying things I ever read in my life, where he says that 95% of everything that has ever been made by human beings has been made since the end of the Second World War. And that was in 1972. So by now, now we must be up to 99.9999999% of everything that humans have ever made has been made since the end of the Second World War. Now this is something to consider. And still, we're talking about a growth economy. And so, when I think about these things, Monsanto, DuPont, all of that, you know, I think this work we're doing is the most important work in the world. Not that I want everybody to be a shaman. It might not be so bad. <laughs> but uh, what I really want is for people to realize that we have been given a wonderful gift. And uh, one of my teachers, Thich Nhat Hanh, he says, wake up in the morning. Wake up in the morning. Oh, 24 beautiful hours ahead of me. What am I going to do with them? Right. Most of us wake up in the morning. I won't even go there. <laughs> so, but we are alive. And we are 
humans, mm. right? Mm -hmm. We are related to that beautiful yew tree. We are related to the, the wood pigeons. We're related to everyone. Yeah. And the, <coughs> somebody asked me, so what, what have you learned? after practicing and teaching shamanism for 30 years. I said, what I've learned is that the idea of separation is the greatest illusion. But we suffer, all of us, from it. So I invite you to uh, start remembering that, in fact, that little tree growing out there, that's our cousin. Not my cousin, our cousin. And we're all in this together. And the final thing I really want to say before we uh, see if there are any questions is I want to share some words from... Um, Chief Oren Lyons, who is an amazing um, man and leader and from the Iroquois nation in North America. And he was talking about their original instructions that they got as a people. And he said, if, uh, which are how to live. The most, most, most important things about how to live. And he could boil it down to two things in the end that he said, this is what our responsibility as a people are. And the two things were enjoy life and give thanks. And for me, when I really, really consider what that means for me, and when I really begin to live it, when I really begin to enjoy my life, but also enjoy life all around me and the fact that everything is so alive, more and more than I could ever think, it becomes this amazing gift that really touches me every day and feeds me and gives me inspiration and hope and energy to go on. Because I feel it's just amazing. And to enjoy life is not, uh, you know, something we do at the weekend or something we do for two hours on a Tuesday when we finally can stop working. Life is all around us. And it is our responsibility to enjoy it. And then we can give thanks from our hearts, not because we have to, but because we want to. And these two things together, for me, really feed the soul of our world and also the soul of ourselves. So we can all be more alive while we're here. <laughs>